Good morning, everyone. Today, we will discuss about obesity and metabolic syndrome. This presentation is for the sixth semester MBBS student. I am Dr. Bhupendra Saha, Assistant Professor of Department of Internal Medicine, BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences, Iran. So in today's discussion, we'll discuss about the metabolic syndrome and obesity. So we'll first define what is metabolic syndrome. We'll also discuss regarding the diagnostic criteria, pathophysiology and treatment of metabolic syndrome. In the second half of the presentation, we'll discuss about the obesity, its definition, pathophysiology, causes, evaluation and the management will be discussed in today's presentation. So what is metabolic syndrome? So metabolic syndrome, as a word suggests, is a syndrome. It is not a disease. It's a collection of the different problems. That's why it is called a syndrome. So it's a constellation of the reversible major risk factors, which we are going to discuss for the cardiovascular di disease and the type 2 diabetes mellitus. So there are some risk factors. If we do not detect that on time, and if we do not take care of that, those risk factors, then those patients are more prone for the cardiovascular diseases and the type 2 diabetes mellitus. Various terminology was given for this condition in the past. Initially, it was coined as syndrome X. Later on, it was coined as insulin resistance syndrome. And some authors also coined it as a pleurometabolic syndrome. But the internationally, the commonly and widely accepted term is the metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is now the most widely accepted terminology for these conditions. So what is the pathophysiology of the metabolic syndrome? So metabolic syndrome has different risk factors and the core of the metabolic syndrome is the central obesity, that is the abdominal obesity or abdominal adiposity. So in the, these are the fats, say adipocytes, and adipocyte on, they release the large amount of the free fatty acids. So if there is a large amount of the free fatty acid coming to the liver, then the, in the liver, there will be the more production of the triglycerides, more production of the LDL, and less production of the SDL in the liver. So the effect of the more fatty, free fatty acid to the liver is there is there will be the more triglyceride, less SDL, and the more LDL. And another effect of the more free fatty acid coming to the liver is the liver start producing the more amount of the glucose. So there will be the hyperglycemia in the patient who are suffering from this condition that is metabolic syndrome, hyperglycemia. In a normal individual, this, the, this increased amount of the glucose cause, this, cause or stimulate the pancreas to secrete the insulin. This is the pancreas and it secrete the insulin in response to the high amount of the glucose. So now what is the effect? There is a more amount of the glucose and there is more amount of the insulin. But the insulin can't act properly because of this free fatty acid at the level of the muscles because free fatty acid also inhibits the action of the insulin. So there is some abnormality going on in the body that insulin, some, they, they develop some insulin resistance in the body. That's why it is also called the insulin resistance syndrome. So the net effect will be there is a more amount of insulin, but insulin is not acting properly because there is insulin resistance because of high amount of free fatty acids. And there will also be more amount of the glucose in the body. Now the three effects will be there. One is more amount of triglyceride, lesser amount of SDL. Second is there is glucose, the level of glucose will be high. And third one is there is the, there is the increased concentration of the insulin. Because of the increased concentration of insulin, you know, the insulin can cause the retention of the sodium from the kidney and it can also activate the sympathetic nervous system. Because of this effect, blood vessel get constricted and it causes the elevation in the 
blood pressure. So the net effect will be if there is a high amount of the free fatty acid, there will increase amount of triglyceride production by the liver. There is decrease amount of HDL, increase amount of the glucose in our blood, and there will be the insulin resistance in our body, and there will be the increase amount of the blood pressure. So these are the problems that is going to occur if someone is having the metabolic syndrome. And the core of pathophysiology of the metabolic syndrome lies in the central obesity or abdominal adiposity. So to diagnose the metabolic syndrome, your teacher is very, very fond of asking this question, how you are going to diagnose the metabolic syndrome? The criteria is given by the NCEP ATP3 as well as the International Diabetes Federation. It has five criteria. As I have already told, one is central obesity. For the central obesity, you have to measure the waist circumference, waist, okay? And waist, how you are, how, how, where you are, you are going to measure the waist circumference? For that, you need to identify your lower coastal margin and the iliac waist. So, lower coastal margin and the iliac waist. And in between the that lower coastal margin and iliac waist, you have to find out the midpoint, and from that midpoint, you have to measure the circumference, and that gives you the idea of the waist circumference. If it is more than 90 centimeter in male and more than 80 centimeter in female, then that is the one criteria to diagnose the metabolic syndrome. For the different ethnicity, the, this, this waist circumference and the, for the male and female is different. For the, for the Southeast Asian population, people have kept the 90 centimeter for male and 80 centimeter for female as the upper limit to define the central obesity. So other criteria are if the blood triglyceride level of 150 mg per deciliter or if someone is in the, in the specific medications like lipid lowering agent, then we, can, we have to take the criteria of the triglyceride as well. Triglyceride level of 150. Third one is low LDL. LD, SDL should be high. But if there is a low SDL, especially in male less than 40 and female less than 50, then it is significant. And regarding the blood pressure, if it is more than 130 systolic or more than, one, one, sorry, more than 80 diastolic, or if someone is on specific medication, that is another criteria to define the metabolic syndrome. And last criteria is fasting plasma glucose more than 100 mg per deciliter, or if someone is on anti-diabetic medications, then that is another criteria to define the metabolic syndrome. So these are, there are the five criteria which can, define or which, uh, which can help us to diagnose the metabolic syndrome. Okay, let us revise one. One is central obesity, that is waist circumference more than 90 centimeter in case of male and more than 80 centimeter in female. There are two criteria for the lipids. One is triglyceride more than or equal to 150 mg per deciliter. Low SDL less than 40 mg per deciliter for male and less than 50 mg per deciliter for female. And other criteria like blood pressure more than 130 systolic and more than 80 diastolic. And fasting plasma glucose level more than 100. There, there, these are the five criteria that you people are supposed to know. And if out of these five criteria, if three criteria are met, then we can say like the, your, our patient is having the metabolic syndrome. Okay. And what are the risk factors for the metabolic syndrome? So the number one risk factor I have forgot to write here is the genetic, important genetic supply. Suppose if someone has some genetic, strong genetic predisposition, then they can have the metabolic syndrome. Second one is someone is obesity. So the reasons for obesity are so many. But if someone is obese, then that person can have metabolic syndrome and we have to work off for that metabolic syndrome. If someone has a sedentary lifestyle, someone has like if, so if the aging population are more likely to have metabolic syndrome, if someone has diabetes mellitus and someone has the cardiovascular disease, we are supposed to work up for the metabolic syndrome. That's why we need to do the lipid profiles. That's why we need to measure the blood pressure. That's why we need to measure the pressure circumference. These are the risk factors for the metabolic syndrome. Okay. Then what are the clinical features of the metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is not a disease. So it, it, it do not have any symptoms. Most of, often the patient will have no symptoms, but there are some physical findings that give us clue to work off in the line of metabolic syndrome. Like 
if a patient comes to me and if, the, if I see the patient is like seems obese and if the patient is overweight, then we have to work up for metabolic syndrome. And you can also get like the features of insulin resistance as in this figure. You can see the, there, is a, there is acanthosis nigricans. These are the markers of insulin resistance. And if you see acanthosis nigricans, then we, ha we, have to, we have to always suspect the metabolic syndrome and we have to work up for the metabolic syndrome. Similarly, if someone has a high blood pressure, then we, are, we have to suppose, we are supposed to work up in the line of metabolic syndrome. Let's suppose, if I see a patient with metabolic syndrome and if the patient age is like 35, 40 and it's, it's obvious, then definitely I, I will do the lipid profile. I will see the triglyceride. I will see the acetyl label. I will measure the blood pressure. Then I, okay, because we have to suspect the metabolic syndrome in such a patient. Okay. So what are the associated conditions? If someone has the metabolic syndrome, if someone is obese, if someone has diabetes, if someone has hypertension, if someone has the dyslipidemia, then what are the associated conditions that our patient can have? So one important associated condition that our patient can have is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That there is deposition of the fat in the liver. And if people know what is NFLD, uh, because we have already discussed regarding the NFLD. Second is you have to always work up for the uric acid level because they can have the high uric acid level. And in case of female, if someone is obese, then we should, we should work up for the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if someone is obese, then we have to always think about the obstructive sleep apnea, like uh, gargar gorsa type. Two. We have to always ask, do you, have, do you snore while sleep or do you have like fatigality? Do you have increased sleepiness in the daytime? Like that you have to ask. So if someone has dyslipidemia, someone has diabetic, someone has hypertension, always keep your mind wide and always work up for the fatty liver, always work up for the uric acid, always work for the obstructive sleep apnea because these are the conditions which, which we often miss in the day-to-day -day clinical practice and that we, which you are not supposed to miss. So treatment, if someone is obese, if someone is diabetic and someone is hypertension, we have to, we have to counsel our patient regarding the diet because we, we should always recommend them to take more fruits, more vegetables and less amount of the carbohydrate and fat. So we should always recommend to take more food, more vegetables and more fruits. Okay. And we should always counsel them to do the physical activity to please do exercise. You have to do exercise because if you do not do exercise later on, you will have over diabetes, you will have the over hypertension then you, you, you can die because of the some cardiovascular disease. Please do exercise, we have to recommend. And we have to do some behavioral modification like avoiding the junk food, avoiding the beverages, alcohol, smoking. We should recommend them to stop those things that can harm them in the future. And if the patient is obese, definitely we have to manage the obesity, so which, which we'll discuss in the later presentation. And definitely we have to manage the blood pressure as well as the high glucose. Okay, okay. I think for the metabolic syndrome, uh, so we have discussed a little bit about the metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome? Let us revise one by one. So metabolic syndrome is not nothing, it's a constellation of the risk factors. It's the, the group of risk factors that predispose any individual to the cardiovascular disease and the diabetes mellitus. Okay, so previous terminologies are the insulin resistance syndrome and the syndrome X, but the now most widely term is the metabolic syndrome. The fact, the core of the pathophysiology is the increase in abdominal obesity or abdominal adiposity. That is the core of the pathophysiology. And the diagnostic criteria are central obesity, low SDL, high triglycerides, fasting plasma glucose more than 100, systolic blood pressure more than 130, or diastolic blood pressure more than 80. So these are the criteria to do, diagnose the metabolic syndromes and we have, it's the asymptomatic conditions and we have to solve suspect if you see someone is having overweight, if someone is having a feature of insulin resistance, if someone is having hypertension, you have to suspect and these are the treatment of the metabolic syndrome. Okay. Now let's go to the obesity. So what is obesity? So obesity is the state of excess adipose tissue mass. It's an increase in the adipose tissue mass or the fat depositing cells. In this two picture, we see in, in the first picture, there is a 
like muscular individual who regularly do the gym and in the second individual you see the obese individual both of them have increased high like like more weight than expected but this individual has only muscle mass there is increase only in, in the muscle mass so this is not a, a, a obesity because there is no increase in adipose tissue so to say the obesity there should be increase in adipose tissue okay and we will have the idea what is the adipose tissue we have different parameters but the simple parameters that help us to identify the level of adipose tissue is measuring the bmi okay that is body marks index and i i'm i'm damn sure that you, you all people know the formula for the bmi it's it's weight divided by height in meter square okay and weight that means 60 kg and if and that should be divided by height in meter square like if it is 1.6 meter then 1.6 square like that we have to measure the body marks index it gives us idea regarding the adipose tissue mass regarding there are other uh, other ways to detect the adipose tissue mass like we can measure the skin fall thickness there are other method as well but, but for the mbbs level just remember bmi will give you idea regarding the adipose tissue mass so for the asian population the normal bmi this is one of the important question that your teacher is going to ask is 18.5 to 20.22.9 okay this is for the european and americans okay and for the year since 18.5 to 22.9 if someone has the bmi of 23 to 24.9 and it's the overweight if someone has the bmi of more than 25 then it's the obesity okay if someone has the bmi of more than 25 then it's the obesity so uh, by by this way we can diagnose whether our person is suffering from obesity or not okay so what are the causes of obesity why some people get more like uh, obese one important component is genetics because someone has the history, paternal or maternal history of the obese obesity then that your child can develop the obesity so it's a very important component genetics but some of the persons some persons are have on healthy diet like taking high amount of the high carbohydrate and the fatty diet like uh, they can have the obesity and some like some prefers the sedentary lifestyle they they can have the obesity like some there are some diseases which can cause the obesity like cushing syndrome is the like one endocrine conditions which can cause obesity and like similarly polycystic ovarian syndrome can also cause the obesity there are some medications that can cause obesity like anti convulsant like especially valproate can cause obesity if someone is taking steroids beta blockers and antidepressant they can be obese and other factors like so if someone is pregnant they can gain weight if someone has the excessive stress and the lack of sleep they can develop the obesity so there are so many causes of the obesity obesity so what are the complications of the obesity how uh, before going to complications just i will again uh, i i am to ask you one question what is obesity obesity is a increase in adipose tissue mass okay okay fine so complications of the uh, obesity so let us go from head to heart uh, okay in the head your patient can have the stroke is one of the important complication of the obesity because they can have other risk factors for the strokes and like especially in female they can have the idiopathic intracranial hypertension in the eye the your patient can have the cataract in the lungs your patient can have the non alcoholic uh, sorry obstructive sleep apnea which i have discussed earlier as well they can have hypoventilation syndrome okay in the heart they can have coronary artery disease they can have hypertension they can have diabetes in the liver they can have nfld in the gall bladder they can have stones in the gut there they can they can have some gynecological problems like infertility and polycystic ovarian syndrome are more common in obese individuals they can have different tumors and they can have osteoarthritis especially of the knee joint they can have gout and they can have the dependent edema so these are the problems of the obesity that's why we need to manage the obesity because they can have different problems so if you if you get a patient with obesity like so someone if someone comes to my opd and if size if i see the bmi more than 25 then i have to evaluate in the line of obesity so these are the five questions that you have to ask 
we have to ask the obesity focus history. What may be the cause? Is it a genetic cause? It may be drug, it may be disease. What may be the cause of that obesity? You have to ask. You took any drug, do you have any other conditions like that? Similarly, what are the consequences of obesity? Because we know what are the complications of obesity. Do we have headache? Do we have cataract? Do we have do we snort? Do we have abdominal pain? Do we have chest pain? We have to ask what are the consequences of the obesity. We should also know what are the expectations, what are the desire of our patient. Okay, before going ahead. After taking the very, very good history uh, regarding the obesity, we have to examine the patient. There, you can examine so many things, but should never forget to measure weight, height, waist circumference, and calculate the BMI in a patient whom you suspect they are suffering from the obesity. Definitely, you have to measure the blood pressure as well, and you have to like monitor or uh, examine the whole body. And definitely, you have to, there as the obesity has so many complications, we have to always screen for the comorbid condition like diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, NFALD, these are the conditions. And regarding the fitness level, uh, we have to ask whether you, our patient is doing exercise or not, what is the exercise capacity level, we have to ask. And last, we have to know whether they are ready to change because if your our patient is not ready to change and if they do not have any motivations if they have they have resistance to change then it's very very like unfruitful to treat them and it's very difficult so we have to motivate them to uh, change to treat their obesity okay so this is the treatment pyramid so initially if we diagnose the obesity then we should always counsel them and we have to motivate them so our First treatment modality is diet and physical activities. And then if like you could not get success with this modification, then you have to choose the pharmacotherapy and at, at last there is a surgery for the treatment of the obesity. So we'll discuss one by one, okay? So the treatment wise, the number one treatment is the calorie diet restriction. So we have to restrict the calorie by around 500 to 1000 kilocalorie per day which cause the loss of one kilo weight per week. So we have to restrict the calorie. And in the, this side, you can see the plate. So half of the plate is like, should be like uh, covered by, uh, the, uh, occupied by the vegetables. And carbohydrate diet should be minimized. And the, we, have, we can also motivate our patient to take some proteins. So, the take home message is always motivate them to take more vegetables, more fruits, more water, and less amount of the carbohydrate and the fat. And they can take uh, milk, they can take cod, they can take the meat without fat, they can take, but we have to always recommend them to take more amount of fruits and the vegetables. That is the take home message for management of the obesity. Regarding the physical activity, what the people have recommended that they have to exercise at least for 150 minute exercises, moderate intensity or 75 minute of vigorous exercise per week. So at least they have to exercise for the 30 minutes per day. And the like, they should avoid taking the lift. They should like prefer taking the steer. They should prefer uh, on like, going to the like, nearby place by walk rather than by going the vehicles like that okay and because if you if, if you our patient is taking if you, if you are doing the physical activity then it it really help us to maintain and maintain the weight maintain our weight that's very important then behavioral therapy because we have to monitor whether we are losing the weight or not if we are many if we are treating our patient by like uh, monitoring of the weight and we have to also uh, counsel them for the stress management because stress is one important component sometimes they get frustrated they get depressed or oh, no, no, i live like that we have to constantly motivate them uh, to for the dietary restriction and the, for the physical activity there is no shortcut for it like there are some stimulus control like if someone is going for, for parties and someone is like having meal in front of the tv then they often take more like calorie. So when they are taking the meal, they should not watch TV and they should, al they should always um, like minimize uh, the party and they should always restrict the 
uh, beverages, alcoholic beverages, and they should leave the smoke. Okay, and definitely we should always motivate them to have to be more positive, positive. Because if they are positive, then they can definitely they uh, restrict the diet and do the physical exercises. If pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy is the second line therapy, and it is indicated if someone has BMI of more than 30 or 27 with some like failed dietary or physical therapy. If someone is having more than 30 and if they are willing to take the treatment and if they are motivated, if they are, if they are motivated enough for the dietary restriction and the physical activity, then only we can start the pharmacotherapy. It has two classifications, one is appetite suppressant like fentanyl, topiramate and locasserine. These are the appetite suppressant. It will act upon our hypothalamus and suppresses our appetite. And there are also the gastrointestinal fat blocker like Hortlitz fat. These are the uh, drugs that can be used for the obesity management. But the um, FDA has recommended fentanyl topiramate combination or lo locasserine as the treatment for the obesity. This is one of the important questions, five questions for you. Pentaramine plus topiramate combination or locasserine is the FDA approved anti obesity medications. In some of the conditions, we have to do the surgery. If the, if the, if the BMI of our patient is more than 40 kilogram per meter square or 35 kilogram with some serious medical condition, we have to recommend them to undergo the surgery. And there are facility of surgery in Nepal as well. And the, this, the name of the surgery is called paratic surgery. It is of three types, restrictive, restrictive, malabsorptive, and malabsorptive. The details of this surgery, modalities of this surgery is, is out of the syllabus of the, uh, of the MBBS. And I think for the obesity, now we are in the last slide of the today's presentation. So we will just recall, okay, what is obesity? It's the increase in adipose tissue mass, okay? We can have brief idea of obesity if I, we can measure the BMI. For the Southeast Asian population, if BMI is more than 25 kg per meter square, you can see person's obesity. There are so many causes of, of the obesity, like genetic causes, like dive, like sedentary lifestyles, like disease, like drugs that can cause obesity. There are some of so many complications of obesity, like some patient, your patient can have stroke, your patient can have cataract, MI, high blood pressure. NFLD, infertility, there are so many complications of obesity, we should be always aware of. If someone comes to in our, in our OPD, then we have to always ask for the uh, different questions regarding the obesity, whether they are ready to change or not, then we have to examine them, and we have to always ask, and we have to always assess the readiness to the change. And definitely the treatment is the diet, we have to always restrict the calorie, we have to increase the intake of the fruit and vegetable. We have to do exercise. And if indicated, then we have to take the medications and sometimes surgery is required. So for today's, I think if you will have understood something about the metabolic syndrome and, and obesity, if you have any queries, any problem, you can write in the comment section. Till the next presentation, bye-bye and stay safe, stay home. Thank you, thank you so much.